G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast, the first ever episode. Uh, today we're going to be breaking down our AFL fantasy philosophies. We're going to be talking about all the rule changes, buy rounds, sub rules, and all the extra coaches and our uh, first picks players, the locks in our fantasy squad. Let's go! G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast. Uh, I am joined, uh, my name is Mitchell Casey by the way, uh, you can obviously find me on Twitter at Ball Boys uh, Fantasy and uh, as the first time uh, joining the podcast, Luke uh, Rogerson, how are you mate? Good mate, uh, appreciate you having me on, I've um, watched a few of the NBA podcasts and uh, just really excited to, to get amongst it, the um, podcasting community in terms of AFL Fantasy is um Really great community. Been watching the traders now for the last twelve months since playing fantasy. And, so, um, so you know what you're doing. You're, you're an official mate, I'm podcaster. Ab- I'm absolutely professional. That's, <laughs> anything I say, take it as gospel. Yeah. Um, no, nah, I'm just keen to get involved and you know talk some shit as well. So yeah, absolutely. We um, so obviously uh, a lot of you guys, maybe maybe not. I don't know. We'll see who's coming in through the door and, and listening early days. Um, expecting obviously lots and lots of you guys <laughs> early on, but you guys might know me from the uh, Ball Boys uh, Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Um, obviously do a lot of work over there on YouTube and on all the podcasting platforms. Um, but uh, as you guys know, us Aussies down here, we love our AFL uh, footy and um, obviously have a little bit of experience with the AFL fantasy. I've been uh well I've been playing for a few years, but in terms of actual footy experience, I think this is where you will outrank me uh yourself being the uh uh goal of the year winner. Is, Mate, is that right? Let's, let's not uh, let's not bring that up. <laughs> I think it's a bit early for that. Um no, I've got a little bit of footy experience. Mitch is the the master tactician when it comes to fantasy, but um uh, I've played foot, footy since a young age, so maybe be able to offer some different perspectives in terms of um like game style and yeah, tactics sure. and how that might impact some of our players because at the end of the day that's what we all want to know is uh how, how that how is that stuff going to impact yeah. our fantasy scoring. So Yeah, it comes back the numbers and that um are all well and good, but it's how it how it translates to the field and, and what the coaches do is, is also a big part of uh, what we are looking at for AFL fantasy. So I guess um, maybe the uh, the jersey at the back here gives it away, but uh, your team that you support, just for the, the fans to know, and, and uh, yeah. again, yeah, also... <laughs> there's, there's a little bit of Richmond merch in the room, so yep. um, you know, no surprise which team I support. I'm a Tigers man. I have been since uh, Dad got on board when Terry Wallace was coaching him. Um, would have been back in 2005, I think, um, and I've stuck with them. So we had a few lean years there, but uh, I'm yep. happy to say I, I um, held fat and we've uh, had a few good years recently. Been all right so. recently. And, uh, and you jumped on board as well, you big bandwagoner. <laughs> yeah, huge bandwagoner. Um, the peep behind the curtains here, um, my girlfriend is, is uh, your sister. So that's, He's got to be nice to me, guys, because yeah, he's dating he's... my sister, so that's how I made it on the pod. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's yeah, the inside scoop. Um, so, yeah, jumped on board when when met you guys and, and saw the passion flowing from, from the family and... Uh, and uh, well, I think actually I wasn't allowed to support any other team. No, no, I think I was... Ellie's the most passionate Tigers fan in our family, yeah, so yeah. I, I take second fiddle to her. She's crazy. So, so uh, yeah, once once I went to see a few games, the MCG, I was hooked, and uh, I got around the boys. So been supporting them. Sort of, I I, I missed the first premiership. Um, I, I came on board at 2018. It uh, must have been the bad bad luck that year. And uh, since I've watched two, you guys went to the prelim that year as well. Didn't we you? did. I I took a bold swing. Oh. I took a bold swing first year dating Ellie and uh, took it to the prelim. Mason in, Cox is and, uh, free in your head. Yeah, that was. Um, <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about that too much. No, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll, let's move on to actual let's gloss fantasy. Over that. But uh, yeah, so fantasy AFL. Obviously, we will be talking a lot about fantasy classic, but we also might touch on a bit of uh, fantasy draft leagues as well. Obviously, my experience in the NBA is is very much more linked to the draft side. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that the, the AFL Fancy Classic side, it's obviously the more popular format. Um, but it's also, I, I, I like it because it's very different to NBA. It's it's If you do the same thing the whole year round, I, I find it gets a bit tedious and, and you sort of, you, you want to mix it up. So for the Classic side, I'm, I'm uh, pretty... Uh, 
pretty keen to get stuck into that. And uh, but we will also do a bit of draft, I'd imagine as well. Yeah, I have limited understanding of the of the NBA fantasy stuff, but from what I do understand. The AFL Classic is probably more of like an entry level fantasy sports. I think there's probably more um, yeah. strategy and whatnot involved in the NBA. So I think Classic's a great one for uh, Classic AFL is a great one for people who are just new to fantasy sports to get involved and still really enjoy themselves. Yeah. So if you guys if you guys are following me over from the uh, uh, fantasy basketball side of things, would definitely encourage you to get involved with the fantasy Classic side. You just make one team and it covers you can have leagues and all that sort of stuff versus your mates as well as everyone else in Australia or overseas who's playing the game, but uh, if you wanted something a bit more closely resembling the NBA uh, style, draft is also a good way where you select your own players and uh, they are yours to keep and you versus your mates and, and league mates. So we'll be covering that. And um, if we haven't already addressed the uh, the hat sitting here, uh, obviously my credentials laid out uh, with the legitimate merch that we've got. <laughs> a bit of arts uh, and crafts went into that. Yeah, it was. Um, it's it's my claim to fame uh, in, so far in AFL fantasy. The uh, the near hat winner. You've um, done well there, mate. Because if I would have put my ranking on there, I don't think it'd fit on the side of the hat. <laughs> it, so, yeah, maybe. Yeah, so, we have um, to go really small font. So you, no, you've done well, mate. You've done well. I, was, and I think. Look, I was pretty proud of myself last year, but um, I think I think on top of you know you could you could you know say that whatever you, you didn't win a hat. Like what the hell do you know? But I think there's also <laughs> there's also some um, there's some learnings you can take away from from all the mistakes you make as well. And I think just the experience of, I think as high as I got was, you know, the top 25, I think at one point, or I might've even made 19, the 19th ranked player around the buy period. And um, it's a, it's a different experience to go through it um, firsthand, the, the pressure and the, the uh, I guess the psychology a little bit more than, than just the, um, what you would think from the outside uh, looking view. I'd never been that high before, so... It was cool to watch, too. Like, I mean, last year was my first time playing fantasy, but I felt like I rode the roller coaster with you last year. And yeah. um, there were stages there where Mitch was a nervous wreck uh, trying to make his trades each week, which was fun for us to watch. So um, hopefully more nervous moments this year, eh? Hopefully, and hopefully more nervous moments for all of our viewers and listeners, and uh, we can get them going. So um, we'll, we'll start up today, um, first episode, just talking a bit more general. We'll, we'll obviously get into a lot of player specific stuff we've got a bit of a plan of going through each of the positions and uh, players we like and overpriced underpriced all that sort of good stuff but today we're just going to have a bit more of a general approach of um, just some AFL I'm calling these the AFL philosophies or rules that um, you live by um, I've gone ahead and done a lot of research I don't know what, what you've done <laughs> here but tactician I'm telling you guys. <laughs> but I've got I've got basically seven philosophies or seven rules I guess you could you could call it that I um, go by. Do you? Uh, I'll throw it over to you first, though. Do you have anything that like you're looking for this preseason, or have worked yeah. well in the past? Or I took maybe a bit of a different tack with with this particular question. Um, I think Mitch has definitely come at it from a, a tactical perspective, but I've come at it from um, more of a wholesome perspective, perhaps. So I think the the two things that I found out last year um, and the things that I'll I'll try and I suppose live by for want of a better phrase um, in 2023 is that I want to um, be able to watch the players that I'm going to pick up. Mm. So prior to actually picking a player, I want to know what their scoring looks like. Sometimes the stats can lie to you. You look at the numbers, you think, wow, that looks, that looks red hot. And then you actually watch them play and you think, hmm, well, that scoring is very game plan dependent, very opponent dependent. And so um, I think one, my first sort of, philosophy I suppose is to watch the players that you want to pick up don't just rely on the scoring don't just rely on the stats don't just rely on Twitter actually watch them watch what they're doing in the game and then the second thing that kind of ties in with that as well is pick players that you want to watch yeah it sounds it sounds like a silly thing and it's not really necessarily a tactical thing but I mean why do we play AFL fantasy at the end of the day we enjoy it we enjoy only only 100 people can win hats only one person gets a car so you might as well try to have fun along the way you might as well Um, enjoy it so my so my two points are not necessarily um you know tactical uh master strokes or anything but just hopefully for your enjoyment and and like I said at the start I'm coming at, at this from a the perspective of someone who's only played a year and what did I really enjoy about it? I enjoyed picking players that I actually enjoyed watching them score the points. So those have been my two things. Watch the players that you intend to pick, but then also pick players that you intend to watch. Yeah, and I think that can reward you as well very nicely. Like I, I implemented the, I implement that strategy as well. Like I try to pick the players that I think, I mean, the players that I like to watch play AFL are the guys that go out there and compete 100% all the time. They never give up. They don't get let a tag or something affect them. And, and I think that obviously 
bodes well for fantasy, but a player like Andrew Brayshaw was in my team from round one last year, and um, he, yeah. he was uh, obviously a, a big breakout contender from last year, and not many people picked him, but one of the big reasons, uh, I, I had my statistical reasons why I liked him in my team, but I also just liked the way he went about it. Um, a guy that I was very keen to pick this year, but unfortunately doesn't look like we'll be able to do that, is Sam Walsh. I was a big fan, he I'm a big fan of him. Way, he? Uh, yeah, just those kind of guys that, you know, uh, yeah. work hard, um, you know, continually just keep going after the footy, tackle when they're getting not getting much of the pills. So, And I mean, these are our philosophies, but we don't necessarily always live by them. Yes, I did pick Braden Proust last year. So, <laughs> probably so goes, you don't always go by them. No, <laughs> Not great for my mental health at all. Um, yeah, but, uh, but, but where yeah, you can try and stick to those if you can. If yeah, you can. for sure, for sure. I'll um, I'll throw you mine as well, and 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 Please you do. can sort of let me know if I you might have uh, to type these down agree. My ranking. Well, yeah, see how we go. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't lock them in too strongly. But number one for me, uh, the the biggest rule that I always follow is that every player, and, and we're talking starting squads at yep. the moment. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about trades and stuff once the season uh, um, goes underway. But picking your starting squad. I think that every player that you pick should have some level of value in in their starting upside, price. Upside, you mean? Upside, upside yeah. yeah. So so that's to say, a lot of people will say you need to have a reliable captain. Yep. You need to go out, you know, Rory Laird. You can't start without him. He's someone that so you know. I'm guessing you're starting without Rory Laird. Uh, <laughs> I probably will not start with Rory Laird in my fantasy squad. Um, last year, didn't start with Jack Steele. Didn't start with Took Miller. Didn't start with Jack yep. McRae. They were the three big dogs um, that a lot of people had in their fantasy squads because they were quite unquote the must-haves. You know, the old rule is you don't get one of them, you get two of them because they're your captain. Um, but I think that if you don't believe that they have a reasonable. Um, pathway to getting better scores and and outperforming their price, then I don't think they should be a part of your squad. The reason I say this is because, well, one, it's it's just bloody hard to average 120 in an AFL fantasy season. Um, you know, you think about the guys last year who came in with that price, Took Miller and, um, and Jack Steele. Obviously, they've put up a great season. They've both averaged near 110 fantasy points, but that's a 10-point slide. Um, so the guys that I like to target, especially in those midfields, which is what we do, is um, is those guys just that sort of rung below. Um, because we know that a player like Rory Laird came into the season, he, I think he, from memory, he was like 111, 112 uh, uh, priced at sort of sort of figure. Um, and those are the guys that can really uh, set yourself up. But even, you know, a- um, Andrew Brayshaw was an example. He was, I think, 102 and then had a, had a, obviously a really good season. So for me, every single player should have some level of value. Um, so for me, a player like Doherty, a player like Rory Laird this season, the table. they're pretty much off the table for me because yeah. I, I don't think that even if they put up what they average, well, you haven't actually gained anything. You've just sort of... It's a good point you make water. too because I think... The, we all know the last five rounds are more important than the first five rounds, mm. whether people want to acknowledge that or not. It's just the case. And new coaches, um, new players coming into the team, it just means that those first five rounds are, in some teams, it's a little bit of a feeling out stage. Yeah. And so that can impact scoring for those big dogs. You're talking well, about so. actual like AFL... Uh, yes, yeah, my apologies. Right. Not, yeah, yeah. not AFL yeah. fantasy, actual um, yeah. actual footy. Yeah. Um, those first five rounds, they can be a little bit of a feeling out period for teams as well, which can impact our scoring. So. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, yeah, but for us fantasy coaches, it's the, it's the same value, right? Right, so yep. and it's probably you know to get yourself off to a good start. You want those guys who are going to be shooting up in price, and yep. then if those guys, you know, even if Rory Laird has a, a hundred round one, it's a decent score, but Still his unders. his price is then going to drop, unders. and yep. his break even is going to shoot up, and you might be able to get him much cheaper than those who started with him. So, yep. um, if you, however, think that. Rory Laird's going to average 130. <laughs> I reckon there's some people. Uh, that's a different story. Calvinator from the traders. I yeah. reckon he's he's on the 130 train. So, so that that's that's where obviously in that scenario, if I believe that, I would still pick him because yeah. I think there's still value. So it's not to say that everyone needs to be 10 or 20 points underneath. I'm not suggesting that, but at least some upside and some growth um, would be that. Uh, rule number two for me is a, a healthy, uninterrupted preseason. Is I've I've written strongly bolded, underlined, advised. I, I'm, I stopped short of saying an absolute lock, but it, it's... You don't it's, want to lock yourself into it's anything. It's pretty close. I think, I think you have to have an interrupted preseason. And I, I went against this, against this rule last year when I picked uh, Wayne Miller in my squad you after did, he was named round one. Uh, yeah, and I think that bit me in the butt. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that uh, that's something that... Yeah, I agree with you. It's one of those things that... It, there's every chance that somebody coming off an interrupted preseason could go on to score well, but if you pick them and they don't, 
you yeah. know you're going to feel bad for picking yeah. them coming off that interrupted preseason. So I think that's just a one that you go with for safety. It's going to depend on the player as well, um, mm. where they where they valued, um, how have they scored previously. So there's a few different factors at play, but I think overall that's a pretty safe bet. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the examples of ones that bucked the trend last year, I think Rory Laird didn't have a healthy preseason. He might have even missed round one from memory. Um, and his scoring built, remember, too. Yeah, so. it did. So he wasn't there at the start of the season. So not yeah. many people, I think no one started him. I think Callum Mills is another example. Yep. Um, again, started poorly. We Came all got good. him at a, at, at a good price, a cheap price. So even with those guys that in the end bucked the trend, the starting uh, results were worthwhile that if you went against them to start with, then it would have paid off. Um, the other one here, the number three I've got is don't be afraid of the mid-pricer, but... <laughs> There's a but. But... There's always a but. You can have too many. I think you can definitely have too many. I, yeah, I would you, try and pick maybe like four at max. You do kind of lock yourself in if you pick too many, don't you? You need a good yeah. balance of rookies that are going to increase significantly in value to then pair with those mid-prices to eventually trade up. Yep. We all know that's the goal. So... Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that one. Yep. Yeah, and I think I think every year is different with that one in particular. Like last year, you you could consider like a James Sicily or yep. like a um, who else do we have in our back lines? Uh, there's a few other guys there that are uh, George Hewitt um, yep. was another example that they were considered mid prices because of their starting price, but they ended up staying in our teams the entire season. They're um, always a risk too, aren't they? Because you, you named some guys that went alright, but then some teams started with a Matt Crouch. Well, I started and, with Taron Thomas. So, Tar- there you go. So <laughs> and, and that, um, the yeah. mid prices are. More of a risk, I'd say, than the rookies. You know yeah. the rookies are going to go up in value, but yeah. with the mid-prices, you can... Yeah. But that's why I say you, you can have too many, because yes. if you have one or two and they still flop, you can deal with that, right? You know, so I had Wayne Miller, I had Taron Thomas. They were the two ones that really flopped for me. Yep. Uh, but everyone else in my team started pretty nicely. Obviously, I, I had uh, I had Matt Rowell as well, but he was a popular one and did actually play well yeah, in the first couple of rounds. Too much, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the other guys that, that went well, you know, you had your, your players like uh, Andrew Brayshaw, yeah. um, those uh, Sicily types yeah. and the, the, um, the Hewitts and those kind of players. But if you have just one or two of those guys, it's manageable. If you went crazy and you, you, you yeah. jumped on a you bunch of them, strike. then, then you, the foot, yeah, yeah. You, you're, you're starting from a big hole in the ground. This other one here, I want to get your opinion on as well, because I okay. have a bit of a... Throw it at me. A, a, a no one over 30 rule. Um, no one over 30. Age. Age, age cyst. Yeah, I know. I've been I've been accused of this before in, in uh, NBA fantasy as Mate, well. I'm not far from thirty. Actually, we're we're yeah, both not far say, from thirty. We're a month, so we're a month different. We're, yeah, so. yeah, so we've been a bit of strife. Yeah, no one over thirty. Yeah, I I just think that I'm trying to think of someone now who's bucked the trend. Throw it back at you. Pendlebury might have been one, but he's but again You're when still... I'm when I refer back to rule number one. I don't necessarily. Uh, oh, Travis Boak might be one in recent years that um, yeah. was was someone who definitely. But, but he's the one that has suffered of that. There's not many people that pick Travis Boak. No, that's despite right. his good average. So. Well, I think. I think, and a few years ago, he was a pick that worked out well because of a role change. So I think there are exceptions, but yeah. for the most part, and a player that uh, again we might discuss in future podcasts who is approaching thirty. Tom Mitchell is a player <laughs> that um, he will be discussed. He will be discussed um, for this rule. I'm considering whether or not I, I, I go against it. I think he will actually be turning 30. I, I don't yeah. know. But but it, for the most part, I, I often find that people over 30, Dane Zorko is an example um, last okay, season where people were jumping on. I was very hesitant too because one, his body and their injury proneness for older players. Yeah. And two, just general decline. Um, no, I'll... And, I'll- Tick yeah. that rule off. I think I'll tick that off. But I'm hoping there's some blokes out there that prove you wrong. But yeah, you're not, okay. You're, you're well, I'm sure they would in, be. You're not wrong in the fact that once they turn 30, the, the snipers tend to sharp to the game. Yeah, uh, yeah. Calves and hamstrings and <laughs> whatnot. So, now nah, I'll tick that one off. Uh, the next one here, the rule number five, there's nothing wrong with a vanilla starting squad. Uh, vanilla is a lovely flavour. You don't want to spice it up a little bit? Oh, look, you can spice it up with trades is my thing. Okay. I, I like, again, if I refer to the mid-pricer rule, a couple. Yeah. Um... I don't think I don't think ownership should influence your starting position whatsoever for the popular guys, but also in it, searching for a point of difference for the sake of a point of difference. I think is the wrong way to go about it. I know you're big on the point of difference. So what's what's your stance then? If you leave yourself at the start with too much of a vanilla squad, are you then in a position where you have to make so many trades to get to your end result that you shoot yourself in the foot? Do you, do you need to start with? A little bit of spice there, so that so that you don't have. There's guys that stick with you all year. I think I think if you are there's 
I think the the spice of a uh, pod comes in play a little bit more as the season progresses. Okay. Uh, because everyone's, uh, despite your team looking vanilla, everyone's team will be different in some way. No, like we're not going to all have the exact same teams, right? So even though you might have popular players, there's there's that the makeup of those popular players is going to be different. So your team will still be unique as a structure. But I think that if you're searching, the, the, I guess the biggest thing here is you're searching for a pod for the sake of it being a pod, then and I you think go on the wrong way. you go on the wrong way about it. Um, yep. you, there might be good players out there and good picks that just happen to be lowly owned. And I think that there will be a few that we might talk about in, in future podcasts. Um, and I know it's a big thing that a lot of people want to find. Yeah. But I think it is probably more valuable later in the season when you're trying to climb rank. And um, especially if you're high up. And I, I know when I was trying to chase the... Uh, the, the, uh, the other hats <laughs> um, that Not I was yeah no I mean that's a good hat but, <laughs> but, but if you're looking for one of those uh, actual hats I think that uh, the closer you get to that top 100 the more you have to be paying attention to ownership numbers but I think to start the season I don't let it really influence my decision too much and, uh, and just because a lot of people are picking another a player uh, the same applies for that. You don't have to follow the crowd. Don't, don't be tempted. Do like, do your own research. Make sure that you are. Yeah, yeah. you should you should be uh, happen, happy with all your players. Yeah. Uh, second last one here. Aim for three to four captains. Um, now this might seem like it's contradicting my first point. I was going to go there. But yeah, I'll but justify. but especially now with the rolling lockouts. Um, and we have ac- access to vice captains throughout the whole weekend. Um, I think that it is it's easier to get captain options on a weekly basis without having to get that big dog. Um, so you think some of those underpriced premiums can still present a captain option? Absolutely, for you? absolutely. Okay. You think about this season. Um, well, again, to throw out some some oh, let's let's use last season as an example. You know, I started with an Andrew Brayshaw who was considered priced at uh, 102, I think, or thereabouts. Um, he was my captain week one, dropped 120. Week two, I unfortunately didn't captain, but he put out 180 points. So. If you are confident in your pick and you think that there is value, I, I would back your gut in that position. Yep. And with the ability to have two swings at it with a rolling lockout, I think that it's easier to make those picks um, and, and still get the value. That way, you kind of get two birds with one stone. No, I think that's a I think that's a valid point. I hadn't considered the the rolling lockout and the fact that most weeks you will get two swings at it. So, if, like you say, if you've got two value options. There's a chance that one of them's going to go off, isn't there? So, yeah. no, nah, yeah, I think that's I think that's a valid point as and, well. And again, you've got you've got uh, we talk about midfielders. Obviously, midfielders are the ones that score the most amount of points. But uh, outside of Rory Laird, you look at the averages of the guys who scored well last year. He's obviously way ahead at 120. But then you take those next couple of guys. Everyone's kind of smooshed in around that 108 to 111, 112. So there's a bunch of players there that on any given week, and and we know it's not they're not scoring 110 each week. It's it's um, you know, cliffs and valleys. If you pick up the good matchup, if you if you get the right timing, again, you've got two swings at it. Um, you don't have to pay up for those big dogs, and I think that's the way to go about it. But I still want to have three or four options so that if there is a poor matchup for one of my guys, I've got someone else to lean on. Um, that's my sort of rule there. And then the last one here, this one is something that I... Implemented for the first time last year and um, would definitely recommend it, especially talking about midfielders. Um, the best players that I like are those that have diversified stat sets. The guys that get tackles, marks. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be a do you, you don't be a guy who's just reliant on collecting a bunch of disposals yeah. and not doing a whole lot with it. You don't want to be a guy who doesn't get marks. So those two-way kind of players, yeah. players like an Andrew Brayshaw, players like a Clayton Oliver is another example that I like a lot. Um, players... Such as someone like uh, a Darcy Parrish, for example, yep. he can get the pill, he but he doesn't tackle. Well, he, he doesn't, doesn't tackle. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't. Well, so at he, least so far, he might come out and prove me wrong. But in in seasons past, he's not really. Uh, it comes down to um, the point I made before as well. Is make sure you watch the players that you intend yeah. to pick up. You'll see how they score. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later in the pod about um, some new coaches and how game style might impact some of those players. And the point that Mitch makes is if you're picking a player that. Um, that scores in multiple different ways, then a shift in game style or a shift in position isn't necessarily going to impact that player as much as yeah. it might a player who um, only gets their, 
their stats through one avenue. Yeah, a player like Josh Dunkley is a perfect example of that. Like he's scoring well in lots of different positions. Yes, he's he does better when he's in uh, center bounces more often, but even when he is playing forward, he can still he can still put up good stats. So those are those are my uh, twenty twenty three AFL fantasy philosophies. Let me know down in the comments. Uh, be the first comment on YouTube if you want to be. <laughs> try and beat uh, me. Yeah, to it. try. <laughs> we would love to uh, love to see your comments over on YouTube if you're listening there, or if you're listening on uh, the podcast version, chuck on over to YouTube, chuck us a comment. We will be answering as many as we can. Try to have uh, try yeah. to have a few less philosophies than Mitch, maybe. Otherwise, <laughs> maybe. You, uh, you might take up the whole comment section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably did run a bit long. Uh, all right, let's let's move on to. Uh, we will talk about um, one position in particular I think I want to I want to talk about because we're going to touch on these guys later in the preseason oh, I don't know as well. if I want to talk about these boys but, but <laughs> I, I want to just get your thoughts early on because it's it's often the trickiest and probably the most pivotal position it's in, already in doing fantasy. my head in and I don't uh, think fantasy open Ugh. rucks it sounds give, like a dirty word already. oh it's give me the heebie-jeebies and, and to put it in perspective at the start of last year, it was my first year playing fantasy, and everyone's going, set and forget, set and forget. Set and forget. Me, yeah, don't, yeah. don't worry about it. This is what you do. This is how you play fantasy. So, right, right, set, a, set and forget. What's yep. this business? And then, as you all know, it went to shit pretty quick. Yeah, it, it wasn't the year so, to set and forget. So, I don't know whether there's a set and forget option this year. Um, very much, the way I'm thinking about Rux this year, it's, it's very much dependent on watching St Kilda play in the preseason. Um, everything that I do in terms of my rucks is going to be hinging on that because it, if a big Ross the boss intends that Rowan Marshall's the yeah. solo ruckman, then I reckon just about every coach in the league is going to have Rowan Marshall as we our probably luck. should. Yeah, I've got some good stats on that, which I might say for another another podcast. But yeah, he yeah he would definitely be a lock in that situation. And then in terms of for R two, then you you go well. Do you look for a guy who's historically been a premium as well and just go with that? set and forget strategy mm. or do you maybe look for a guy that's a little bit undervalued and then spend that cash somewhere else so um, like I said it's all hinging on what St Kilda choose to do so yeah. I'll be watching uh, very keenly I think um, if I refer back to rule number one that every player should have some value this is probably the only position where I might buck that uh, I might buck that trend and I might yeah. depending on the year and every year is different I mean last year the set and forget was was Gaundy or Gorn and Grundy. Gaundy, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I didn't start with Gorn. I started with Grundy and I actually started with Rowan Marshall last year because if you remember, um, uh, old mate missed the first game and I thought potentially with the Achilles, he's an old guy. Um, he's Paddy. Yeah, Paddy, Paddy Ryder. Um, yep. Look, it works for round one. It <laughs> went shit pretty quickly. But, <laughs> but um, I, I still try to find value if it's there. Yeah. The only thing about the Rucks is that you've got two of them, right? Yeah. Um, and there's only 18 number one rucks out there and and it seems to me I don't know if you agree with this but it seems to me like the two ruck system is in vogue I think that Melbourne kind of are the forefront of that with their premiership team in 2021 with um, Jackson and Gorn yeah I I agree that it it might be in vogue but I would disagree that it's always the right thing to do I think you, you have if you've got the caliber of Ruckman that yeah, Melbourne do I, yeah. and, and did at that stage, then of course, either yeah, of those boys absolutely. can go forward and be dominant. But then you've also seen teams like, um, you know, Collingwood this year when Darcy Cameron came in, filled the void, even Richmond for a but lot even, of years. But even Darcy Cameron, you know, Mason Cox was in there 40% of the time. Like he wasn't. Yeah, and to be honest, they're both nuffies. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. the point I'm trying to make is that you've got, like everyone would say, Darcy Cameron's still a second tier Ruckman. Yeah. You're not putting him anywhere near the category of Gorn. Yeah, as an and, actual Ruckman. Yeah. And they showed that with a bit of a tweak in the game plan, they can still play good footy. So I think teams will be looking at their cattle in terms yeah. of whether they choose to go with the two-ruck strategy and, and their game plan, I suppose, as well. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely it's it's a, a head-scratching position. But I think, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, to me, just the early look, I don't see a whole lot of value options for the Rucks at this stage. I don't, there's no one screaming. There's no Braden Proust, I don't think, this year. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe... I, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I feel, well, well, to start the season, he was a decent pick. He was. But, um, you know, th- uh, maybe we'll get a, a Jack Hayes or someone like that uh, come out of the woodwork, and, and obviously we have to be uh, attuned to that. But at this stage, in on January 3, uh, <laughs> pretty we're, early we're on... We're going early. We, uh, I, I don't see too much value, so no, I, I, I would I'm, be okay maybe... 
breaking the rule a little bit and paying up for the rucks. But just wanted to, to get a, a bit of a touch on that one and uh, yeah, stay tuned. It's giving me anxiety talking about it, so <laughs> I think we should move let's on. Let's move on. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about uh, the next topic here. We're going to talk about some changes in the AFL this year. So a few different rule changes. We're going to start first with the sub rule. So again, <laughs> help me with the... So is it the oh, same thing? I just, or, love, I just love the look of the vest. I yeah, don't, yeah, yeah I don't have the vest. vest. No. But um, it's, it's just the, the medical sub, but without the medical? Yeah, look, we, I think we are all we can all read between the lines. The clubs were exploiting the medical oh, sub yeah. rule towards and, the uh, end. And I'll put my hand up right away that Richmond was definitely yeah. on the forefront <laughs> yeah, of that. Yeah. We were. Don't, don't give us any Richmond hate. We, we yeah. know full well that Absolutely. Dimmer was exploiting that. So I think, t- to be honest, the AFL's just, um, just gone, hey, look, we know what's happening here. It's probably... From the AFL's perspective, it's a bit of a blight on the game when you've got a rule and the clubs go and exploit it. So I think they just, in this particular instance, they say, hey, you've got a tactical sub now. Which is fair enough, I think. Um, do you think that this changes anything for AFL fantasy? Like, do you think that it's going to be vastly, well, not vastly, but at least a little bit different to last year in terms of how we would approach anything? Or Yeah, I, look, because teams were considering it a little bit... Um, Lucy goosey last year. I don't know whether anything does change for fantasy. The only, the only things that you kind of look at from a fantasy perspective with this is, um, particularly when you're looking at like the rookies that you're selecting, they can sometimes be prone to, um, to getting the well, not getting the best. Now I was going to say getting the best. Um, and then in addition to that, you kind of look at what type of players are clubs typically going to. Um, going to make as their tactical sub. It's probably somebody who's going to eject a little bit of pace to the game, change the game up a little bit. Um, so you'd have to imagine that, um, you know, big cumbersome Ruckman's not going to be mm, not going yeah. to be put in as your sub. Yep. You're going to get somebody who's going to try and change the game. Because effectively, my understanding is that's what the AFL want the clubs to do with the rule now, is that they want them to be able to try and shift the course of a game with a tactical yeah. So yeah, make make it a bit more like you know if it's if it's going one way, make it a bit tighter. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think um, the only thing I can think of from like a, a fantasy point of view is maybe like our cash cows. Um, yeah. uh, maybe the clubs might be a little bit more willing to take a young guy out earlier or or debut him as a a sub. I think I think debuting. Uh, uh, I mean, I know some clubs did it last year, but debuting a, a rookie as a medical sub seemed a bit. Not on. I yeah, don't know. A bit if of a this, bad taste to it. Is that kind of what if, you're getting at? Yeah, I don't know if this makes it more enticing for clubs to do that, or or if it's still a bit of like a don't do that kind of a thing. But I, I'm a little bit concerned that they might be a bit more willing to debut someone as a, a sub than they were last year. Yeah, I think you could be onto something there. It's probably just it's probably a wait and see, isn't it? It's like with yeah. any new rule, we have to see how it evolves, um, how the clubs use it. Um, I know if I was uh, debuting for an AFL team, I wouldn't want to be starting as the sub. Yeah, I'd, no, I I'd think be... I, I still think it's a shit thing to do. Yeah, um, but you know, I'm not the one out there making those decisions. And um, yeah, I think I think just with the, the fantasy things that we need to adjust for is just making sure that the guys and obviously you do the best with what you got, but yeah. make sure the guys that you are selecting and grabbing those rooks are best 22 players or best yes. 21 players now, really. Because yeah. if you're that 22nd guy, chances you're are you're, you're going to be subbed at some point in the game. So yeah. we may need to start talking about best 21 instead of uh, best yeah. 22. So yeah. no, that, could, that could be the, the, the adjustment there. Um, the buy rounds. The buy rounds are different this year. We've they got are. Four. We've, we've got four buy rounds and they, they just look weird. I, I don't know. How, you've got four weird. teams and you've got two teams and you've got two rounds where you've got six teams. So this um, has been done before, the four, but it hasn't been done like this in yeah. terms of the, the way they've done it. Before, they when they were playing games in China, I think it was Port Adelaide. Yeah, so it was sort Saints. of forced their hand in that situation. Look, I, I haven't done too much reading on the buy round, so I don't exactly know what the AFL's justification in going this way is. You might be able to shed some light on that, but it, it obviously does impact our fantasy um, selections, particularly because the buy rounds are so important. Now, like I've, I've said a couple of times now, last year was my first year, and God, I had the boys up and up and running to start the year. God, I was I was bragging to Mitch, telling him, <laughs> telling him how good I was. He's just going, "We're up, young fella." The, the buy rounds, the buys, are, the buys buy are rounds are coming up. Yep. I said, "Mate, I don't don't talk to me about buys. I'm I'm absolutely <laughs> humming here." And yep. uh, inevitably, the buy rounds came around, and uh, my team actually came out worse than I think it was when it went in. Well, so yeah, see, that's um, yeah, that's I not sh- what you want. I should have that's heeded, point. heeded your warning, uh, yep. wise man. Um, so this year, I'm going to be doing a little bit more research into how I can set my team up for the buys. Yeah, so the buys, it's, it's a it's a tricky thing, and um, 
uh, so in the past when we had those four rounds, I don't know why they've done it this way. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what the AFL's thinking as to why, but in terms of how it affects us fantasy wise, obviously you've got the biggest thing here is that there's uneven teams, right? So there's there's one round where there's two teams on buys, one round where there's four, and then two rounds where there's six. So I think there is an adjustment that we need to make. Previously, the the buy round that was earlier was usually the ones that had the two teams. I think it was those Port Adelaide, and I think the Saints often went over as well. So what we would try and do in the previous seasons is we would actually avoid those players to start off with because you pick them up after their buy. And just looking here, there could be a few little tasty treats coming off their buy in, in round 12. I'm looking Brayshaw, Steele, Mills, yep. potentially. So yep. um, that could be... Absolutely, could be very yeah. So it, it, could be, it could be a strategy we use. The only thing here with this one here is you've got the two-game bye week after the first buy round. So I think I, my early thinkings, and I'll probably reflect on this a little bit more as the preseason goes on, my early thinkings is actually that those Suns and Geelong players, and they're probably not the most fantasy relevant teams anyway. No, so, no. so take this with a grain of salt. Uh, but those Suns and Geelong players probably get a slight boost, in my opinion, because... Obviously, when you get to their buy rounds, you're going to have it's still best 18. The yeah. AFL Fantasy have come out and confirmed that. Um, you're going to have a lot of players that can cover for those guys who are so out. So you're thinking starting with those players. I think they get a slight yeah, boost. I'd yeah, use it as a tiebreaker. So if you're yes. tossing up between Jack Steele, Took Miller, you're not really sure. You're going Took. Maybe, maybe you give Took the edge because he's got that buy round and he's yeah. someone that you can cover for a lot easier. Even though... Uh, Steel is on the four buy round, a four uh, team buy round as well. So better than last year, but having just two teams, it's it's going to be a piece of cake to cover for that round. Mm. Um, and you're still going to have plenty of guys playing. See, so it would so, almost help if those two teams were more fantasy relevant teams. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, could, you could stack up on yeah. on a couple of guys, but you're right. Probably uh, just looking at that, Took's probably the only fantasy relevant. Tom uh, Stewart, maybe Tom Stewart. Sorry, and I yeah. some people looking at Mitch Duncan, maybe. Potentially with defender status this year, so yeah. th- there's a, there's a couple, none that I would say are genuine like locks. You've got yeah. to have them, so um, I wouldn't really let it dis- uh, persuade you too much. And in buy rounds in general, when I'm selecting my starting squad, I actually don't pay too much attention for it um, to start off with. I'll turn it on, you know, use that uh, uh, f- assistant coach yes. fantasy option, and just make yeah. sure that I don't have everyone yeah. on the same buy round. If, if you look too much into it too early, it can become crippling. That's right, you yeah. just <laughs> And you miss out on all that value beforehand. Yeah. Like if you if you didn't pick Andrew Brayshaw last year because oh, you already had heaps of round 14 buy round, well, you missed his 180-point yes. game, you missed all these other options, and by the time he got to the buy rounds, he's just super expensive. Yeah. So you're talking about me, right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that coach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, I think for me, I don't overthink it too much. When it gets close, around six, seven, eight then I'm definitely thinking about yep. it. But to start my team, I'm not too concerned. Yep. Last little thing that we want to talk about here before we just pick our first guys as the teams, uh, as the game opens. New coaches, new game plans. Uh, this is where I'll turn it over to you a little bit. Uh, what do you think are these new coaches going to bring and are there any particular ones that we need to be aware of? Yes, yeah, so we got a we got a couple little little uh, things to keep an eye on, I think, here with a few of the new coaches. So we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about Ross the Boss, Ross Lyon, uh, back at the Saners. We're going to talk about Kingsley at the Giants, coming from Richmond. Clarko's now with the Roos. And then we're also going to talk about uh, Brad Scott, um, God help him, uh, yeah. in the Essendon yeah, gig. Well. You couldn't pay me enough to do that. So we'll, we'll talk about Ross first. So the interesting thing with a few of these coaches is that we've got a little bit of history on them as well, mm-hmm. which makes it handy. We can go back and have a yeah, little bit of a look. Yeah, they've obviously been in the systems before. Yeah, yeah. now given their, their styles are going to have evolved since they coached previously because the game's evolved and, and they'll have picked up new things. But um, when I was having a look back at some of the stats for, for Ross Lyon and particularly his uh, Fremantle coach teams, because that's more recent, mm-hmm. um, I was buoyed by what I was seeing. So I think that there's there's definitely opportunities in a, in a Ross Lyon coach team for midfielders to average 100 plus. So in yep. his time there, I was looking at stats between 2013 and 2019, I think was his last year there. And guys like Fife, Neil, uh, we all know um, Michael Barlow, um, yep. averaged 100 plus over multiple seasons. So there's, I think there's opportunities there. I don't think Ross is going to uh, necessarily play his midfielders in obscure, ridiculous positions like some coaches do. Hey, yep. go, you know, he's not going to get um get beveraged, yeah, um, yep. as they do over at the dog sometimes. So for me, that kind of fills me with uh, some confidence for for Jack Steele, obviously. Yeah. Um, but the one that I'm still a, a little bit unsure on, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts here, Mitch, is is Jack Sinclair. I know. 
know he's going to be. He's yeah. obviously carries a hefty price tag this year, um, but he he actually showed at points throughout last year that he can do it in multiple positions. He went into the midfield, and I think um, that was early in the season. A lot of people yeah. picked him up, and then there was this worrying period where he started playing half back, and everyone kind of their worries yeah, were eased was, when he continued concern. to average. Yeah. The only thing, the only thing that I do worry about Sinclair over Steele is that Ross has actually come out and said that. Um, he wants to lead a side that goes quickly forward. So it's a little bit in vogue in the AFL, isn't it now? Like Collingwood were, um, you know, everyone's sweethearts last year. We loved watching Collingwood play. What did they do? They went forward quickly. Yeah. Um, I'm biased. I like watching Richmond play. Yeah. What do they do? They go forward quickly. Is that good for fantasy? No. So Look, that's I'll, a little... I will, um, I will say, though, that like, if we if we use Richmond as the, the, the template team that sort of made that game style more popular, Collingwood last year... What are the players that average the best in those teams? It's it's those it's half backs. Dacos, so, it's short, it's uh, Hooley. So that's where I come back to roll. So f- Sinclair's a watch for me because if he plays half back in a team that has a game style like Collingwood and Richmond, then I'm more interested. Yep. Maybe not to start, but just I'm more, I'm watching. Yeah. Um, whereas Steele for me, I'm I'm high on Steele. Yeah. Like. He's the kind of guy, you look at his stats, he's one of those blokes that you mentioned that he gets his... He Rule gets number his, seven. Yeah, he gets his um, stats in a variety of different ways. Yeah. And in historically, in Ross Lyon coach teams, he lets his midfield, midfielders go to work. Yeah, um, So those are my thoughts on, on St Kilda at this stage. Uh, but just keep an eye on that because Ross Lyon's come out and he said that he wants to play that quick game style and that's not necessarily something that's been yeah. historically um, what they've related done. with Ross, Ross yeah. Lyon. So. I'm very interested to get your take on uh, GWS and uh, and their their <laughs> coaching recruit because obviously he's got the uh, the Richmond background. He does. Um, uh, a few people are nervous about that. Um, yeah, it's one of those ones. I don't want to come out and speak too authoritatively yeah, yeah. on on a brand new coach because we don't have. He's, know, he's obviously of these guys, one of the ones that we don't have data on in terms is. of fantasy scores. He is now all the all the people coming out of Richmond speak so highly of Adam Kingsley, and so I think um, regardless of how it pans out for fantasy, he'll do a great job at GWS. Uh, it's just a matter of whether he takes that Richmond game style. Yeah. For GWS and then how that impacts the players. And as we all know, it, even though they've lost a few, the Giants still have some pretty fantasy relevant players. Yeah, so we're talking about guys like um, Cornelio. I think he has the DPP this year. Yeah, he's forward again. Yep. Um, I've, we're talking about guys like Harry Himmelberg and where does he play? I'll have a bit more info on uh, that later. A bit more info on that. Yep. And then um, with uh, Timmy T and uh, Hopper, Hopper going, going yep. to the Tiggies, then. How does Tom Green, Tom Green's role yep. look like? Yep. What does he um, Perryman. Look like? Perryman Kelly, I know yep. you were big on last year. Uh, yep, and might still be this year. So for me, like I said, it's just a watch, isn't it? It's yeah. it, we, we have to see what it looks like in the preseason. We have to. So I think yeah. him above everyone is sort of like you're looking at you're looking at interviews, you're looking exactly. at preseason Press games oh, um, sure. and, and quotes and things like that. Above all else, yeah, I think and, is probably the biggest takeaway. And much to the dismay of uh, fantasy lovers all around Australia, there has been a little bit of intel come out of GWS that Harry Himmelberg has been training with the Fords, ah! which is disgusting. It's yeah. disgraceful. Um, someone needs to get down there and fix that because I think... I thought if, he was good as a defender. Mate, like, I, I like, couldn't agree more. I don't, I don't know what Adam Kingsley was watching yeah. last year because... It must he, be all the time that he spent the ruck that he only caught those glimpses. Mate, he's, he's a unique operator because of his size, he can come and impact third man up. Yeah. He plays a less... I, I thought he was good, but... Even when he had to play on a man last year, he played well. And then, mm. I mean, his foot skills are... They're pretty good. They're elite they're, for a big guy. They're pretty good. So let's see if um, Adam Kingsley comes to his senses there because I think if he's in the back line... We're all picking him. It's a back line. It's it's a pick. If it's a forward line, it's a fade. So, yeah, I think he is obviously... I mean, it's simple when you break it down like that, but obviously we've already seen in the past that he... Uh, game to game, it can be different. Oh, we don't, so, yeah, we don't um, want that. And just throw a new game. coach in there to make it a bit more... So, I think he is he's very interesting. The one guy also... Uh, the next guy... Um, I do want to spend a bit of time on, and maybe we can breeze through Brad Scott. <laughs> but but Clarko, that, Brad. Clarko that. and North. Um, what are we expecting from him? Um, and uh, are we expecting a shake-up? Obviously, North is not, I mean, to put it lightly, the the best fantasy-producing hey, team. Roost, but <laughs> uh, no, do, we, do we see a change of the guard? The or one bloke this that year? can produce is... Horrible hammies. So yeah, well, it's um, well. First, let's start here. Do, do you reckon he's going to cop 
a player like Aaron Hall seagulling it back there? Or, <laughs> seagulling. Um, or Look, is it a is couple of stat- fly? Well, a couple of stats for you that leads into that question. So Clarko's, Clarko's obviously you know the best coach of our generation, but he he's a thinking man, and I wouldn't expect him to come out and start to implement the you know Hawthorne game plan of old. He's going to come out with some new stuff. So it'll be interesting mm. to see what happens there. But elements elements of that Hawthorne game plan suggest that outside ball winners, elite users tend to rack up the fantasy points. So right. have a look here between twenty thirteen and twenty. Um, 21, so it's a bit of a, a broad scope. But the su- successful dominant scorers at Hawthorne were more of those halfback types, some uh, more elite users of the football. So right. Clarko likes to get it in the hands of blokes who can use the football, which, I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah. So yeah. typically his game plan has been more of like a controlled use the ball okay. by foot. Well, that's good. As opposed to yep. a, um, a chaos. Um, but it's yet to be seen whether he implements that at North Melbourne. So the guys who were big scorers back in the day for the Hawks, like your Hodges, elite user, yep. um, floating across halfback, Mitchell's more of a midfielder, but that bloke, as good, as they, pill, off, yeah. as, yep. good as they go on, on both legs as well. And then Jordan Lewis and Isaac Smith, so like running yep. back when they can use the pill. So okay. keep that in mind with North Melbourne. Um, you know, where does that leave a guy like Aaron Hall? Where does that leave a guy like Luke McDonald? Yeah, he's an interesting one. As uh, I can't remember if he's uh, again. We, the game's not open as we're recording this, so yes. I can't easily just check right now. But I think from memory, he's a midfield only. Is he option, okay? Well, that kind of hurts him a little him, bit, doesn't it? So, um, but, but yeah, for Alistair Clarkson, it would just be interesting to see how much he balances that that Clarko game style um, with some of the new trends in in footy with um, chaos. Because uh, I mean, if we're talking about what's what's the biggest overall trend in game style in in footy. It's being able to play chaos footy at finals time. Yeah. Geelong won the flag, but why did they win the flag this year? They won the flag because they implemented they changed, yeah, yeah. a chaos style uh, yeah. along with their controlled style. So yeah. uh, we'll see what Clarko does. Um, if it's a controlled thing, I'd be looking maybe at some North Melbourne halfbacks as much as it would pay me to pick North Melbourne players what in my a, team. What about someone like a, um, a Jai Simkin or someone of that kind of ilk? He's, he's been someone that I've, I've been watching last year. He was, he was on my watch list for most of the year, but it just... North Melbourne were just that bad, really, and just didn't get enough of the ball for him yep. to ever really fully break out. But I do think he's got some fantasy ability about him. I think he can play a bit of a, that like inside-outside kind of game, like you know, rule number seven. I think he can get a lot of the marks and a lot of the tackles as well. Do you think that he might benefit from that kind of a... Again, I don't watch a whole lot of North Melbourne, so I can... No, I'm, I'm with you as well, and that's probably why I don't pick the players in the team either. Um, Simkin finished 2021 strong, didn't he? And that's how he, he got on everyone's radar. Yeah. See, so yeah. I'm not kind of jaded by that yeah. because I wasn't around when, yeah. when he was doing that. So for me... It, I'm not going to pick him. I'm not really going to think about him unless I see something from right, him during right. the preseason. The other guy there I've, I've got here in my notes as well is that um, a little uh, little bit of a hint coming out of North Melbourne as well that um, Luke Davy Zuniak uh, yes, has been training with the forwards, working on his forward craft. Yeah, so, which is unfortunate for us. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, terrible read, that, that article. <laughs> yeah. um, so maybe... Uh, Maybe Alistair Clarkson trying to mould him in like a um, like a Petrarca, Dusty. Oh, kind of, I don't think he's in that calibre, but but well, yeah, that, that kind sort of like that, yes. Yeah, no, I know what you're yeah, saying. Jordan Degoe, you know that kind that's of sort of a, like mid, a role goes forward, kind of kind of a role. Yeah, yeah okay. a, a poor man's Jordan Degoe. Um, <laughs> well, that's a that is a poor man. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, not not big on Degoe. <laughs> well, I'm more of a Dusty man myself. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, he, he was he was another one. Uh, those probably the two players that I'm watching very closely. Uh, again, I have heard that the same reports that you have as well with the, yeah. him training forward, which isn't uh, ideal. Uh, but I think that would help uh, my guy uh, Jai Simkin. And then obviously Brad Scott. Just one more on. <laughs> sorry oh, to catch sorry. you off, Mitch. Just one more on Clarko. Um, an interview with Nick Larkey um, in the last couple of weeks, just coming out saying that. Um, North Melbourne wouldn't be adopting the Hawthorne game style. So, um, yeah. you know, that's uh, that you can take that as it comes. Players will come yeah. out and say that kind of stuff, but just. Yeah, it's, it's hard watch. to know exactly exa- what Nick, they're referring to. Nick Larky to wouldn't well. lie to me, but would he? No, no, no. Not he good would. trust in Nick, Nick no. Larky. No. Um, he, he knows we're going to put it on the pod, so. <laughs> <laughs> he probably has no idea. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go He'll on to. Yeah, Brad Scott. I think we can go through him a little bit quicker. What, um, is there any major takeaways that you found with, with your research with his history? Uh, it's dire. I'll put okay. it that way. Not good. It, it's not good. But then consider some of the cattle he was working with at North Melbourne when he was there. So bet- again, between 2013, um, 2019, there were only two seasons where a player averaged over a hundred 
fantasy right. points during that time. So one was um, Levi Greenwood. I can't exactly remember the year. And then the other was Todd Goldstein. So it's rough. Yeah, it, okay. it's rough. But then when you go back and you have a look at the stats and you look at the names, you think there's not many players true, there true. between that time that were probably did, capable of that. Did he, that. did he take any of those teams to finals or anything I think, like that? I, I think, think he made a, a yeah, I think he made a prelim at, at least once. And then uh, I know that the Ruse beat the Tigers in a um, oh, final. We went to the, the G and that was just so, sickening stuff. So that really. then indicates to me, though, that obviously, obviously not all of this, the squads, but some of the teams were at least yeah, competitive. He, he in, did have some success. Sense. No, he did have some success there, like limited success. But but again, when I look at the individual names and ask myself, right. is that a fantasy scoring player? The answer is probably you would, you no. Would say that they were. Okay. So maybe with because now he's going to be working with cattle that yeah. we're very Zach interested Merritt, in. <laughs> yeah. Parish, Parish. Yeah. I know people are interested in what um, Andy McGrath does this year. So yeah. that makes uh, that makes it all a little bit more interesting. But one thing that I did uh, read from Brad Scott, which you know made me. Um, feel pretty positive was that he that he did an interview where he said hey I'm big on trying to get players into the role that suits them best not trying to push them into a role that the team needs which I think right. is a positive to come out because if you've got players playing in positions that they want to play in that's good for yeah. us that's good for scoring well where does uh, where does Andy McGrath want to play does he want to play as a midfielder or does he want to play as a, a halfback McGrath a halfback is the quote okay. from Scott so McGrath okay. a halfback and I think I think it, just doing my research that McGrath um, not set the world on fire, but showed positive scoring at half back. And then there was this notion that he has to come into the midfield. And when he came into the midfield, he just didn't produce what everyone was expecting. So if he goes back to a half back um, in a role that he's comfortable with, does that then maybe it's like that Sinclair kind of a situation? Sinclair short. Does that yeah. you know make mm. him one of those guys? We don't know, but we'll we'll watch. We'll interesting, watch. interesting. Okay, no, no, that's good information. Very good information. Lots to obviously to watch um, and uh, listen. Yeah, to, listen think, to the coaches' press conferences too. It's it's always a, you have to read between the lines, but you can get some good stuff. I do. Off, I, I do also think that you've got to listen to the the actual or look at the actual video and not just read the quotes. Yeah, body well. sometimes, <laughs> yeah. sometimes the quotes can be alarming, but yeah. with the way they're said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't don't um, just click on the clickbait yeah. <laughs> yeah, when it comes right. out on AFL.com.au. That's right. Com. We've, uh, <laughs> we've, we've gone a bit longer than I thought we would, but uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's wrap it up here with basically our first player picked or the player that you think is the biggest lock in your fantasy team right now. Obviously, again, recording this January 3, so <laughs> who knows, um, but... Uh, who, first, who would you say? The, me, I'll go first? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, the first, first player that I picked in my squad was, and uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention him before when we are talking about this position, but uh, Tim English, to me, was the first player I picked in my team. I, I think that... Uh, I just can't get excited about Tim English. I don't yeah, know. No? I don't know what it is about old is, Timmy. Is it the way he looks? He looks like an Easter Island kind of guy. <laughs> Look, I won't say it on air, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. He's a funny looking dude, but there's no there's no denying that he scores well. So maybe I should consider it, but he... I mean, that's all rucks though, isn't it? I mean, they're all big loafing. <laughs> they're all weird dudes. That's not around. <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, he wasn't even on my radar, to be honest, Mitch. So, uh, but there's no denying that uh, when he's that sole rock at the dog, he's, think, he scores well, doesn't he? I think I think just the addition of um, Lob this year. Um, Stephen Martin's obviously gone. From so the you're team banking now. on Lob playing forward predominantly. Is I that... think I think he's got, he doesn't want to play too much. Ruck. Yeah, I think he's come out and said that. Hasn't yeah, he? I think he he's, he's like a twenty percent chop out ruckman that leaves an eighty percent here for Tim English. He's he's always been touted as that kind of guy that is like the Grundy successor in terms of fantasy pedigree from like juniors. Um, so but he's just been taking time with filling out and being becoming more physical. Last year, obviously, he it was his breakout season. I bloody should have picked him last year. <laughs> I nearly did it when Steph wasn't named. Uh, that should have, could have, would have, man. Oh no, yeah. Anyway, kicking myself still. <laughs> but I think that of the ruck options we have with Grundy and Gorn teaming up, you want that kind of a guy that's just lock and load, eighty percent CBAs, and I can just. Maybe the other one look for some value. Uh, I don't know if he's got a lot of upside, okay. but I feel pretty safe that he's going to be the top one or two rucks of this year. So does that does that make him you, your R one and Marshall you're considering for R two uh, rather uh, than the other way around, uh, or is it based on price? Yes, okay. Um, yeah. But I think I, I Marshall's I, got a bigger ceiling. Say for example, if I was drafting, be. like if we're talking AFL draft, yeah. I'd be drafting Tim English first. Safer, yep. But Marshall's a bit again, more. It's, it's January, January three. three. <laughs> Marshall's January a bit three. more speculative. Yeah, at this, yeah. At this we, stage. We, we don't know. I, I think again. Yeah, Marshall definitely has the higher upside in my opinion, but obviously a bit more risk. Yeah. 
Okay, no, I don't mind it, but definitely not what I who I would have picked. Okay, um, who's your who's your number now, one pick? Just keep in mind my philosophy. It was picking players that I want to watch play, and this this kid. I don't kid? know. Okay. I don't I know. You were going to say Dusty Martin for a second. <laughs> <laughs> he's in. He's in. No, this kid is as good as they come. Nick Dacos is. Yeah. Okay. Just to watch what he was able to do as a first year player last year, um, and just the excitement of what he can potentially do this year uh, is just ridiculous to me. Um, some of the some of the decisions he makes on the field, how much time he seems to have. Um, he's like a mini mini Pendlebury, but with the opportunity to be even better than Pendlebury. Yeah. And I think, you know, he obviously spiked in value um, quite a bit last year being the best rookie option, um, but he's still undervalued. He, he'll, in my opinion, so. he'll go over 100. I don't know exactly what he was Over 100? Yeah. Oh, in, in my opinion. That's spicy. Because the thing, the thing with him is, Craig McRae is going to keep fostering, um, fostering Even with Tom Mitchell coming in? Yep. You he's think that helps keep or hurts him? I don't, I don't mind if he stays at halfback. Yeah, okay. I, I, I would be surprised. Based on what he did last year, uh, if I'm a player at Collingwood, I'm, I'm like... Get that bloke the ball. Yeah, he's playing. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, he can have all the kickouts. Any any time he's on, I'm giving it, it to him. It, it was, he wasn't a kickout guy. I haven't got the stats in front of me. But well, like, if he I'll, wasn't, I'll, he should be. I'll check that. Yeah, actually, check right check now. that for us because I'm going to give Craig McRae a call. If he wasn't taking the kickouts, then they're doing something wrong down there. But um, it, it, perhaps he's not the best undervalued player. Perhaps he's not the best player to pick with your first pick. But God, I liked watching him last year. So I think I'm definitely, definitely a strong chance of having him in the okay, team. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. So looking at those kick-ins right now, he was second behind Darcy Moore. Because okay. um, Darcy Moore just goes and snatches the spare ball and runs yeah. out of the square. <laughs> if, if, if I look at the splits between like the first half and last, the second half, definitely after the buys... Dacos started to take a lot more of those okay. those kicking. They realised they realised what they had. They go, oh yeah, this bloke's pretty bloody good. Nah, Let's to be run. honest, I think they always knew what they had. But yeah, so yeah. I mean, I mean, he wasn't doing it exclusively. Darcy Moore was still there at the end of the season doing it. They sort of shared that role, um, yep. but maybe he takes a bit more of that responsibility with a bit of experience under his belt now. So I, I do think that there's upside in there, and he's definitely in consideration for my team for sure. I had a couple. Um, couple I don't know if I call the lock just yet. Okay. Okay. All right, look, look, here are your backups. Couple, we'll just go through them quick. A couple of little, <laughs> little backups is if Adam Kingsley comes out tomorrow and says Himmelberg is playing in the back yeah, right, line, right. picking him. Yeah. And then uh, am I going to pick Tom Mitchell just on FOMO? Yeah. <laughs> is the see, question. I think is, that's going to be a big conversation for another podcast. But yes, yeah, we, we is, might. We'll tease is, that, but yeah. we, won't, okay, <laughs> we won't go interesting. into it. I'll throw another, another player out there that I think maybe isn't getting discussed as much as he probably should be. That was probably close to my first pick, and that is Dylan Moore. Uh, big you, big you, fan of Dylan Yeah, you big are. At the end. No one else knows who he is. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> you, Mitch, Mitch picked him up late last year, and he's just uh, a master of consistency, isn't he? He's, You're he's, not going to... He's, he's that. He reminds me very much of like a Josh Dunkley when he first broke out. You can, think he's going to... score forward. When he gets a chance in the midfield, I think he's going to be he's going to be pretty good. So would you be picking him based on, hey, he's just a consistent 95, 90 no, scorer? I think he's got, upside. I think he's got Okay, upside. so you think he's going, yeah, I think he's he's got going to be... Okay, man. I'll we'll talk about that when we get to I our hope, forward podcast. I hope uh, you're podcast. right, and yeah. I will jump on that bandwagon if that's the case. Yeah. So, uh, but that'll be all for us today, guys. Thank you very much for listening to the first ever AFL Fantasy Podcast. Um, you can check us out, obviously, on YouTube if you're uh, listening on podcasts and on all your podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, all that sort of jazz. Uh, follow us on Twitter, myself at Ball Boys uh, Fantasy, and Luke. Where can myself, the, everyone can find uh, you? Twitter at Luke Rojo Seventeen. Um, I think I've got all of 10 followers at yeah, this let's, stage. Let's, so let's bump any, you up. Yeah, yeah any, <laughs> any help would be appreciated. Uh, and I'll try and uh, actually post some content. And uh, I'll probably just yeah. retweet things to start with just to yeah. get, get a handle on it. <laughs> just, get a, just get around him. Let, let, let's boost him up. He's, he's joined feel, Twitter just for this podcast yeah, now. Look, so let's, I, let's I don't even on. mind if you feel sorry for me. Yeah. <laughs> some, but, pity, some pity followers. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. But uh, yeah, make sure you hit us up on Twitter. Um, ask questions, whatever you want. Um, and then we'll sort of get back to you as, as best you can. Um, coming up. Up, preview for a couple other podcasts. We're hoping to get uh, uh, to tease uh, next podcast. Matty Mottram is going to be joining us to talk about how to actually play this game and someone who <laughs> obviously um, doesn't have a fake hat and has a very real car sitting in his Yeah, uh, no, he doesn't driveway. need a hat unless it's a sunny day when he's driving his car. Yeah, but, so he's yeah. going to be joining us and talking about yeah. how he constructs his uh, starting lineups. Or, or sorry, I mean, 
basketball talk, uh, his starting <laughs> squad for AFL Fantasy. And then after that, we're going to be breaking down each position, underpriced players, overpriced players, some mid-priced madness, uh, and then also talking maybe a few points of difference as well. So make sure you guys check us out over there. If you are watching along on YouTube, thumb up the video, subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time. Later. It's a good song.